125 years ago, when Frederick and his son Gerard set out their ambition to find new and original ways of improving lives. It's the spirit of innovation, of course, but also of partnerships with business, industry, and academia, with a simple core belief that no matter what life throws at you, there's always a way to make it better. By examining problems from every angle, by understanding people's deeper needs, by challenging the status quo on their behalf. This is how we turn unexpected possibilities into great innovations. This is the spirit that has guided us for 125 years and will continue to guide us into the future. Innovation and you. Phillips. Thank you. Sita, do you want to come and join me on stage? So that was the first commercial break. This is the second one. Because you've got a former and a current sponsor of the Williams F1 team in, uh, uh, on stage now. So. David. Hello, sir. Thank you for yeah. flying in for this as well. Not too many slides. This is just, just so you know, we're going to have a bit of a chat. And it's not going to be too much about the past. This is not, you're not c coming to watch the, you know, the two old blokes in the balcony at the Muppet Show. It's not going to get like that, I promise you. Well, I hope not, anyway. Um, and then I'm going to share just a little bit about what marketers are after from some research that we've done at the WFA and some other thoughts on that. And then we'll bring the other guys up to talk about some of the wider issues of the day. So, long and really funny introduction to CTEL, which has all been taken by uh, <laughs> my friends. Um, just a quick, maybe a, a one or two minute intro, just to tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I think Ranji has done a bit of the intro. You can see uh, some pictures there, uh, which, which show what I do. Um, grew up in India, in lots different parts of India, and uh, started working in India, first with the uh, Saatchi partner, and then uh, with Ogilvy in Mumbai. Moved to Dubai uh, with Ogilvy. Moved on to Mindshare when the agency sort of split themselves up. Uh, was in Dubai for 10 years, uh, looking after Middle East, North Africa. Uh, for Mindshare and then uh, moved on to the Philips role in 2006. Uh, so I've been uh, with Philips headquarters in Amsterdam uh, for the past almost 12 years now uh, in a media marketing role. Um, so that's my day job, as uh, Ranji mentioned. Um, from childhood, I have been uh, singing on All India Radio first, then moved uh, to sing uh, on network television. Uh, won a few competitions uh, at All India level, um, started DJing uh, on the side, uh, voicing for uh, movies and serials in India. When I moved to Dubai, I was DJ for about six years, hmm. doing a lot of voiceovers there as well for advertising. I mean, there would be advertising breaks on radio. There were, out of the five commercials, maybe three were mine at a certain, certain uh, point of time. Uh, and then once I moved to the Netherlands, I continued DJing a little bit, uh, but also performing a lot within, I've so, uh, tour, touring in the US, in uh, different parts of Europe, etc. So that's, that's, Amazing. that's the part that I've continued Phillips to do. Phillips in all of that, sounds <laughs> And then, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not even sure you're in the right part of the conference, because you know, you, you, it sounds like if, if, you, if you're a gamer, we could get you in all of them. Yeah, it's good I don't have a hand mic, because I just have the urge to sing when I have one. <laughs> Well, I can't claim to match you on any of those. A uh, committed gamer, though, for anyone from the gaming industry. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but uh, David, I know this is supposed to be an interview where you ask me questions. But because I have an experience of 25 years in the industry, you have more than me. So Thank the you. total 60 or plus years of experience that we have, I think it should be more of a dialogue where I can also get to ask some questions. Happy, happy, right. happy to try anyway. Good. If I can Thank remember you. that far back, I'll answer anything you throw at me. Um, I really wanted to talk about the tipping points, though, and to think about you know, where things really started to change. Because this is a profoundly different industry. I grew up with print, cinema, radio. If you were really rich, you maybe got to do a bit of TV if your brand was huge. Um, but the world's changed. So what, what do you think have been the big, big tipping points in that? Yeah, I think I remember the days when we used to write on transparencies and have those on projectors to, uh, to, to yeah. go and uh, address clients. 
No, I think for, for the industry or the media industry, the advertising industry, the tipping point when, was when the agencies separated out. So right from working under one roof where clients got to use and leverage the services of the entire agency network, we had the creative agency separate out from the media agency. So that's from an industry point of view. I think when it comes to consumers, uh, the tipping point really comes when, uh, as human beings, we like to do a few things, right? One is uh, we like to seek knowledge on the first, yeah? We are seekers. We like to connect with each other. We like to talk about each other. And we like to talk about ourselves. And the third thing we want to do is we want to run this business of life. Now, when you have search, social, and e-commerce coming together, that's, for me, the second tipping point. And I think all this has been revolutionized by, by something that you hold in your hand or keep in your pocket, where you have the world in your hand or in your pocket is, is the real tipping point for not just the industry, but for consumers, you and me, and all of us sitting in this room at large. I'm glad you mentioned both of those things. I was actually part of that agency separation process when it happened. It didn't really happen for, in many cases for good business reasons. It happened to accommodate the um, desires of the individuals involved in the business at the time. And it's, you know, I'm sure we're going to come back to this with all of us, talk about agency structures, because we seem to be almost coming back full circle to full service under a different guise. Now you tell me, how, how, how do you see it evolving now? So well, the, the, tipping, the big tipping point for me, I think, was five or six years ago in China. So anyone who's worked in China, you will know there's 90 to 100 markets that matter there, just 90. You know. um, and I think there were two or three when I arrived, maybe five, six years ago, where video was bigger than TV. And this amazed me. I couldn't believe this thing was happening. And when I left two years ago, more than half of those 90 markets, our brands, and a lot of others, I'm sure, were planning video first. And we used TV if we needed it to top up. And that was a complete you know, flip in the whole way we thought about media. So I learned so much then. And I think that was the big change. So of course, we know that's a possibility now in other markets. And it's a, more a question of if than when. And how TV and how broadcasters adapt to that will be interesting. Um, but it's given me a, a sight of what's to come in other markets, which I found really valuable. But I also think, and again, let's, let's keep it as a dialogue. You know, when we talk about media, and you and me, we are both media professionals, mm -hmm. I personally believe there is no magic in media. Media, per se, is not magical. It's about the content that is magical. Media is only a delivery mechanism of that content. And that, that is where the focus should be. We, uh, you and me, we do a job of just conveying, you know, bringing that content to life through the various media channels to our audiences. I think, I, I think there's some truth in that. And there's a dirty little secret for a lot of marketers who look after media budgets is most of us have ex media agency at some time or another. And we've spent half our careers telling clients how complicated this thing is. And then the other half telling our colleagues how simple it is and how they need to get on with that. Um, so yeah. So I think, I think we need to, even as uh, media specialists, we need to focus more on content. And, and how can we bring content and media together and create that magic for audiences? So let's just go back to the public. I mean, how have they evolved? How, have, have people changed in the way that they think about media and the way they consume media? Or is it just that what we put in front of them has changed? Of course, I mean, we have evolved, right? I mean, we all are consumers. We are, we are advertisers. We are media agency, you know, professionals, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we are all consumers. And we have seen how we are evolving. I mean, we have seen how our children are evolving uh, in our homes and how they are doing much more than we used to do in our days. Uh, I mean, forget uh, working with two devices at one point of time. They are, they are really the multitaskers. And, and, and with that, with the, with the availability of information, with the availability of choices, I think people are becoming you know, much more critical editors of, of content, of the choices that are given to them. And, uh, and, and that evolution is, is, is significantly increasing with, with growing generations. And do you think brands are keeping up with that? Some brands are, and some are, are trying to catch up there. And, and uh, when I say brands, it, it, it holds true for 
advertising agencies, of creative agencies, of media agencies. Everyone is trying to do a catch-up uh, if, if they are not already uh, being in the forefront of making those connections with audiences. I think something we're seeing a lot more of now is people stopping just, I mean, we, we used to think about media in buckets, you know, different bits on a media plan. It was all very linear. Instead of thinking about shopper journeys, consumer journeys, the kind of things you probably heard a lot about this week. And it comes home to me, in the rare occasion that I sit with my family and we watch something on a TV screen, and then for some reason it has to be paused, and there's this scrabble with all the members of the family reaching for the Mac pause button, the Starhub remote control. The, you know, no one knows what we're actually watching anymore. Is it being streamed off an iPad? Yeah. There's at least five different places this thing could be coming for, from. And so to think about these boxes that we used to work in, it just seems completely irrelevant. These absolutely, days. absolutely, fully agree, yeah. Um, agencies. <laughs> We started to talk about how you know, the agency model changed dramatically during the time that we both started in the business. It, I mean, clearly in a state of flux at the moment. Have you got a sense, and I'm particularly interested in it through a European lens, because yeah. you're, you're based in the Netherlands these days. I'm really interested in your views on where you think, what direction of travel is for that, and whether you've had any uh, trials or successes in, in reshaping the way the agencies work. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we all as advertisers, we feel we need the specializations that come off each of these agency partners. But over the past couple of years at least, as we speak more with our peer group, we are trying to understand how we can also bring them a bit closer together so we, we get the benefit of you know, the individuals yeah. and make it a greater sum, right? Uh, so, so that one plus one is not two, but one plus one is four. And that is something I'm sure many of us as advertisers are trying to work out with our agency partners. And I must say, I can't talk about all agency networks, but I must say the ones that we work with are really into the game with us and they really want to uh, drive the partnership ahead, keeping in mind what is our requirement as, as an advertiser. So, uh, so they are working around it to make sure that we can leverage the best out of them. And Cesar, I know this isn't an exact science, but where's the glue coming from that's bringing the agencies together? Is, it from one, is there such a thing as a lead agency? Is it a marketer's job now to bring together 20 different disciplines? Who's doing it? Yeah, it, it is the marketer, ultimately, because uh, we know what we want out of them. Uh, and we know where are their strengths. And we are able, I think we should be able to, to leverage that strength uh, and make it all work in the spirit of partnership. I'm uh, really glad you said that. I mean, I remember a time maybe 20 years ago when a very esteemed client that I you know, was desperate to work with decided to do 360 degree thinking. Yeah. Got all the agencies in the room and said, sort it out and walked away. <laughs> that was it. That was yeah, his yeah. idea of bringing us yeah, all together. Yeah, and, you know, yeah changing the world. So it's, it's, it's great that marketers are ready to step into that. Absolutely. I think it's true yeah, to yeah. a large extent these days. We, we, we all are in it together, I mean, yeah, and you have to work with that spirit. So where do you think that's going to end up? If you, the long-term yeah. future, if you, you know, I mean, there'll be people here from uh, various agencies of various I, stripes. Yeah, I am so. not much of a crystal ball gazer, but uh, but there would be some form of synergy because uh, I think the individual silos are getting to a tipping point now. Um, and I believe it, it will have to come together in some form or, or shape. Because, because again, as I said, content and media have to work hand in hand to deliver the best experience for the consumers. Now, ultimately, when you do marketing with the consumer at the heart of it, these things have to come together. In fact, within Philips, we are starting to leverage some of this in-house, where we are, we are managing the content, not ourselves only, we have the agencies support that structure, but the content and the media are being um, planned, bought, uh, optimized, reported as a whole. And does in-house mean Philips people, or does it mean Philips agencies yeah, it's, partners it's, coming it's, in? It's a mix of Philips people as well as some of the agencies working together, sitting under one roof, working, uh, working hand in hand. We'll come back to this in the second session. I really want your view, Sam, on this. It's got quite an interesting take on agency and housing. Don't, don't, don't let me forget. Um, okay, global priorities then. Yeah, I mean, you're 
sitting in the Netherlands running the business ac across the globe now, w what would be the big priorities for you? Well, the big priorities uh, for us is, uh, of course, to continue leveraging the digital ecosystem, um, but doing it in a manner where you still make sure that the consumer is at the heart. The fact that you need to uh, create experiences for the consumer in a way that they are accepting you, pulling uh, you towards them, rather than us pushing messages, uh, is, is really the priority that we are working towards. Uh, so that, that, that's the core. And then, of course, you are, you are trying to work with all the technology, with all the data, in a GDPR compliant way now, uh, which is, again, uh, something I hope we will we'll bring up in the uh, panel session that we have just after this, um, is also critical. So something I'm interested in whenever I visit a country is to go, or a market is to go, is to kind of leave, leave all my prejudices or my, my previous visits behind and try and see what's new and what's disrupting. So I think that, that's the thing I find most fa fascinating at the moment. If you take someone like India and Geo mm -hmm. and what they've done to uh, that market in terms of almost free broadband on almost free smartphones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we can't even give data away anymore because the public just says, no thanks, got that. We don't need it. Yeah, it's yeah. been revolutionary. Are you How, seeing many yeah. changes like that? Yeah, I mean, I think the change that you see in Europe is not as much as the yeah. change that I see in other parts of the world. Uh, um, and I know we had a brief discussion before this around, uh, around this specific subject. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of high decibel change that comes out of uh, the western part of the world, the far west. So I'm talking about uh, the west coast. Um, and there is a lot of low decibel change that's happening in this part of the world, uh, right from India uh, east. And look at all the work that's happening in China. Um, so uh, that's not talked as much possibly as, as the change that comes out of uh, you know, uh, the West Coast, but, but there's real change happening. And, uh, and frankly, when, when I get to visit the markets here, the buzz, the, the fact that everything is not decided, everything is not within a box, and there is so much possibility, yeah, yeah. is really exciting. Uh, so is there anywhere in Asia at the moment that is really exporting great ideas back into, into the mothership? Well, I think, I think from, from Singapore, yeah. we get a lot of ideas, from China, definitely. Um, within Europe, I must say, uh, the eastern part of Europe, there is lots happening there. Uh, when we go visit there, talk to people there. I mean, I was there for a conference last year, and I was speaking to a taxi guy, a car driver, who also actually works, but this is his uh, second job. The amount of information he shared with me on, on uh, the digital ecosystem, frankly, I was, some of the things he was telling me, I learned from him. So there's so much, so much knowledge that's happening, uh, coming out of there. So these are the markets where, where I see uh, a lot of ideas you, coming. You just reminded me of a conversation with a taxi driver in Shanghai, really upset, because his, his second line of work, is, it, it's, it's gone now, which used to be uh, uh, reselling phones that people left in the back ah. of his cab, because nobody leaves their phones anymore, right? Because you're stuck to it like glue, because it's your life. And I thought, I, mean, I, I do some work with the Mobile Marketing Association, and I use that a lot, because, wow, how, you know, how much has that changed in the last few years? I can't think of anything worse than losing my phone. I've lost it. Um, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, but what are, are there, uh, and if, if you think about markets where you know, new news is arriving and you're learning from them, is anything coming out of the smaller markets? Are you seeing any that are developing so quickly that they're leapfrogging the media scenes? From well, as, as I said, I think some of the uh, things that we're learning from the small countries in Eastern Europe yeah. is fascinating. The work that they're doing at least on, on the advertising that, that I get to see out of them, how they're optimizing, how they're sort of almost very entrepreneurial in the, in the way that they're taking things and running and making a difference to us. Uh, we, see, we see that increasingly coming out of those markets. Great. And I, personally, I'd probably add Pakistan to that. For, mo for the, 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 the mobile change there has been amazing. And if you haven't had a chance to, to see what's happening with their mobile scene, it's really worth knowing more about. You also spend a lot of time in the Middle East, right? How, how yes. Do see, how do you see change coming up? I was, I was sitting last week with a, a very well-known gent in the Middle East who's got a media near monopoly there, who you all know. I, I think I know who you're talking <laughs> and, about. And yeah. uh, we were reminiscing over how his dad had set the business up 
selling, printing covers, the sleeves for video rentals. That was the first pan-Arab paid advertising one generation ago. And he's now overseeing uh, media sales for probably 40 or 50 TV stations, all pan-Arab, hitting 20 plus markets. Um, and he has a huge digital division, which three years ago when I went there smelled of sawdust and had a nice new desk, and it's now got 100 people yeah. in it. So the change has been absolute. Um, and it's a good analogy, actually, for what's happening in the media scene. You know, anyone who goes to Dubai, when you drive around, the roads move. Yeah, you're on this road one day and the next day it's gone over there so because they're just constantly being rebuilt and developed and that's kind of what I feel is happening with the media scene at the moment that you can write all the maps you want yep. but they're only going to tell you where you've been they're not very good at telling you where you're going so you've got to pay attention at all times um, great so we're going to come back to you in a minute uh, with the rest of the panel but just you know while, while, while I've got you here and with Ranji's introduction obviously you know some of us probably know you better for your stage performances than for your uh, media yeah. directorship uh, oh, okay. um, so th you've got a lot of fans of your own the theme today is for the fan of it so um, you know what does it take to for, for a brand or for uh, a personality to, to build the fan base these days yeah I think my biggest fan is at home my younger son <laughs> In fact, since he was six years old, he would travel with me to make sure my music stand is fine and the, all the lyrics are in order, etc. Uh, but I do have a few fans, uh, as you said, um, back home in India, in Dubai, where I used to host uh, radio shows. And I must say this, um, my show used to finish at one o'clock in the night on a weekend. And there would be, every week, there would be about four to five cab drivers waiting to take me home because those days I didn't own a car. And I literally had to throw money at them and run away because they would refuse to take money from them. Now, why would they do that? Why would they wait every week for me to take me home? It's because I think I was helping them connect with their home, connect with them, their background, through what I was saying uh, over the radio, through the music that I was playing, right? Uh, similarly, when I'm on stage, uh, even in Europe, I have people coming over on stage after a point of time and starting to dance, etc., almost pushing me out of the stage. So what I'm giving them is an opportunity to be performers themselves, right? Because everyone in, in her end is a performer. So I think for a brand or for a performer, it's important to give a bit of what you want to convey, but give much more, much, much more of what people want you to convey, or people want to hear, or people want uh, to connect with you uh, uh, for. So I think that, that balance uh, is really important for a fan uh, to connect with you as a brand, uh, as an advertiser, as a performer, or whatever you have. That's great, and I hope we'll get time to come back to that, because you know, in, in the, world, the media world's getting very hard-edged in terms of it's all about performance these days, and we seem sometimes to miss the bit about telling stories and building relationships, and I hope we can bring that back up in the conversation. Uh, we'll talk again in a minute, but for now, thank you very much for you. your time. Thank you for the dialogue. Thank you.